The first question is you represent the buyer. The title company has informed you that the sellers have been funded. Your buyer <coughs> arrives at the house and the seller has left trash cans filled to capacity and the garage has a lot of junk in it. This, this is a Friday afternoon and the trash won't be picked up until Tuesday. Now what? So I have on here, obviously, first thing you do is you call the listing agent, but remember, this is already closed. And now they get there and they've got this big disaster. So, so why, why didn't they do the final walkthrough? They did, and they were still moving out. They did uh, it the day before, and they were still moving out. So I, I'm gonna tell you in my career, I have helped people move out I've helped buyers move trash out. I, you know, it's one of those things. Corey, you probably have been in that situation also. Um, I, I, are you there, Corey? Yes, I was muted. Sorry. Yep, have been oh. there. Yep. Yep. What did What did you end up doing? Oh gosh, I've I've showed up. Um, I mean, if it was one of those things. One of them was where the uh, seller had, they were already out of state. There wasn't anything the other agent could do, but I, I've just showed up and picked up stuff, brought a truck and trailer. I've hired some guys um, and make sure things were presentable either for my seller or for my buyer. Smooth it over, make it, make it work. While we're on this topic, according to the sales contract, how many days can you do a final walkthrough for up to how many days? The answer is four. And it's always one of those, one of those toss up questions. If I do it four days in advance, I can get my final walkthrough notice and list all these things. Or if I wait the day before, maybe there won't be as much as many things to write down. So the contract says, how many, how many walkthroughs are you entitled to? One. However, in this situation, because this was kind of a, this, this really did happen, this was kind of a hoarder house, the buyer agent probably should have wrote in the special agreements that the, the buyer would have two walkthroughs instead of one to help make sure everything was completed. So on that walkthrough, you, do, you discover things. Um, how, who can go back on the walkthrough? Anybody want to answer that? So the people that can go back can go along with you on the walkthrough are obviously the buyers, the buyer's agent, and also any, any co contractors or any inspectors that went through originally during your 10 day inspection period. So any of those folks can come back and check. And sometimes you need to do that, especially if it's the HVAC system or there was electrical issues and things like that. You definitely wanna bring them along. And they, they might charge you a little extra to come back, but. To me, it would be worth it. Okay, so number two, let me try. I'm doing this on my own, so here we go. Okay, you represent the buyer. The seller has moved out of the house. The buyer requested to move items into the garage prior to closing. What form should you use? Well, the answer's there. So there are two there's two forms. There's one possession by the buyer prior to closing. And then there's a limited purpose entry by buyer prior to closing. I strongly don't, I really don't like either one of those forms because it can turn into a disaster. And in this situation, we are the buyers. There's a three car garage and the sellers have moved out. Our buyers, are selling their house, they wanted to move a lot of their things into this three car garage with the seller's permission. But here's what happened. The seller's daughter came home from college and parks her car 
in the middle bay of the three-car garage, limiting the access to the entire garage, which, what are you gonna do about it? You know, there, there's words exchanged, there's emails flying back and forth, but to enforce it is difficult. And the other thing is, if you ever do something like that, if you allow your seller to uh, have the buyer move things in the garage, you always wanna make sure that all the doors are locked going into the house, including like the, the door in the garage to go into the house. You wanna make sure those are all locked and your buyer <coughs> would need to purchase um, renter's insurance on their items they have in the garage. And if you, if you take a few minutes later on and look at those forms, the very top of the form, it'll say that we, it's not recommended you do these things because it always ends up in a, I, I kind of thought this was going to work out fine because the sellers had already moved out, but it turned into a disaster. We, when we were selling our house in St. Peter's, we had yeah. a, um, <clears throat> we had a potential buyer. We, we were caught up with her for like two months she was trying to sell her house and mm. she was having the the people on her end were having issues getting financed but she wanted to go ahead and start putting some of her stuff in our garage but she didn't have financing yet and we said no way and then she Good wound up never, she wound up never getting financing and I, <laughs> I had just happened to watch something on the news or something where squatters. where squatters had that's how squatters had taken over someone's house by just putting their stuff yep. in there so what, and in this case what if what if something what if something really did happen and the buyer couldn't close and now they got all that yeah. junk in there how do you what are you going to do you're going to um, take it all out and put it in the driveway or you know hey Kristen okay. hello hi oh, so um I, I don't recommend you do that. What's happening when I click the question, the answer populates too. Well, I don't know why that. Oh, no, just that whenever they did it. It's... No, it, it didn't work that way last week. Okay. Jamie told me something to do, something to do at the beginning. And I don't know. Yeah, it is. It's here. You want to play it from the beginning? Uh huh. That's probably better. Okay. So then while I'm talking to you, it just occurred to me I didn't remember it from before. I'm going to take away the questions so you can't see them. Which one are you on? We're going to number three. We kind of talked about this just slightly. Um, so number three. So let's let's talk about the difference between possession by buyer prior to closing and the limited purpose. So limited purpose could be the basement. Typically, it's the garage. Um, so that, that would be the difference. The possession prior to closing would be giving them possession of the entire house before closing. And I really don't like that. So again, I'm gonna, I will ask that you look those two forms over and familiarize yourself. There's also where the seller can have possession after closing as well. Um, Again, that's not all. Sometimes that's a way to get a deal accepted in this in this market. But is what letting the seller stay, not pay rent for a couple months in order to get your offer accepted. So that that does happen. Ready? Yep. Would, would they have to get rent as insurance for that? Yes, absolutely. And the the new buyer now owns the property and would be required to have homeowners insurance. And then the seller now becomes the tenant. And who's paying for the gardener? Yeah. Well, that all those things need to be described in your agreement. Like bullet points, the yard work, the, you know, what happens if the seller stays and the dishwasher or the HVAC quits working? Who's responsible? It would be the new buyer. So it can get really uh, messy. Yes, that's a good word, messy. <laughs> okay, number four, you represent the buyer. The buyers used a special sales contract and signed the waiver for inspections because why? The special sale contract eliminates all inspections and we need something documented in writing that 
we've advised our buyers to have an inspection and they've agreed in writing not to have one. So the buyers move in and there's water backed up in the basement. So now what? So one of the things you should be doing before you even get started with writing your offer is printing out the seller's disclosure statement and looking to see, did they make any disclosures about water backing up into the basement? Um, so let's always make sure to review the seller's disclosure statement. If you see a section that's blank, you should call the listing agent and ask for a seller's disclosure amendment to explain why that section was left blank. So that can definitely lead to litigation. And I will tell you, it's it, I don't, sometimes it can be worse than them lying is leaving it blank because you've left it. It's our job. It's our due diligence to, to go over those things with your, with your buyer and make sure. If, if you have the listing and they send it back to you and you've got blanks, you need to say, look, you've got, you've left, I know it was an accident, but I need you to complete it the best you can. You can't leave, can't leave sections blank. But, but in, the, in this market, if you start, you know, poking the bear, they're not going to take your offer. They're just moving. Right. That's true. But I don't want to be the bear that gets poked after they buy it and have something wrong. Right. Issue now, don't we? Yeah, we do. This is right. We have an issue now where we have the seller, the seller, there is a basement, there's a finished basement on the seller's disclosure statement. The seller wrote NA, not applicable. When I look at that, I think it's a I think it's a slab. So it's just it's important that you print it out. Maybe you highlight some things that your buyer needs to look at. You're printing out the tax records. You're printing out the agent only format from the MLS because what you want to get paid and to get paid. How much am I going to get paid? That that agent only format is going to tell you. It's also going to tell you what type of agency the seller's in, the listing agent. Okay, number five, you represent the seller. They completed the seller's disclosure form, and upon reviewing it, you discover they left the basement section blank. What should you do? We just talked about that. You need to, you need to tell them, hey, you've got to fill it out to the best of your ability, but not, not blank. Okay, so you represent the buyer. There's a propane tank buried on the property. Who pays for the remaining portion of the propane gas and how is it determined? So the buyer pays for it. That's right. And how do you determine how much is left in there? You have to get it um, tested or you know, however you're looking yes. at propane. And so how much is the buyer going to pay for that propane gas that's left? Market, market rate, whatever propane is. That's right. Ding, ding, ding. You've got them all. Yeah. Yes. I, I've, so not, I've, never, not, I've never been to a house with propane. I wouldn't even know what it looked like. So. Well, yeah. So, it, you know, maybe it's a propane tank and they only use, you know, one tank a year. It doesn't, I, it's not what they paid for it. It's what the current market value is. So it's like if we bought gasoline three months ago for $3 and today it's five, they're going to pay five. Does it still need to be in the contract? It's in there. Is it? Yep. Mm -hmm. Should you be concerned who owns the propane tank since it's buried in the ground? What'd you say, Lisa? You're on mute. I'm just guessing. I would say, yeah. Yes, yeah, so you should be. You should be concerned. Uh, page two of the seller's disclosure statement, line fifty-five. It asks, "Is that propane gas owned or leased?" Even though it's buried, because guess what? I had this happen, so I know. I paid close attention and got that owned or leased onto the seller's disclosure statement some years ago because we, we assume it's buried in the ground, you own it. Who buries a propane tank? 
Okay, you represent the seller. The property is a two family and one of the units has a tenant. One of the tenants is moving out before closing. You receive an offer on a special sales contract, no inspections. On the day of walkthrough, the buyer reads a note posted on the bathroom mirror, this, to this toilet doesn't work properly. You receive a final walkthrough notice that reads seller will have a licensed plumber check the toilet. If there are any issues, the seller will repair the toilet and make sure it is functioning properly. Now what? So they wrote an offer that's on a special sale contract with no inspections, but now they go back through, the, they do their walkthrough and they see this note posted on the mirror that the past tenant left there. So does the seller have to get that toilet looked at? I don't think so. So, so the contract says that the property will be in the same condition it was on the day that you wrote the offer. So we did get a plumber come in there and look at it. It was fine. But I, I'm going to say that in the future, if you have a, a multifamily unit like that and there's a tenant moving out, do run through yourself or have your seller run through and check things. Because in this case, this was a tenant that was disgruntled, not paying their rent. And so they were just trying to cause a problem. Okay, any questions about that? So this one um, is kind of a long, but it's got two parts to it. So you represent the, the buyer and the property is located in the city of Arnold and the offer is written on a regular residential sale contract. There's a gravel driveway that runs from the street and completely around the house and returns back out on the same street. So it's a U-shaped driveway. The first section is located on the seller's property at, up into the middle of the back of the house. The additional sections owned by the neighbor with an easement granting the owner permission to use the property you, you are purchasing. Upon completion of the municipal inspection, the city required the gravel driveway be hard surfaced. The seller agreed to hard surface only the section of the driveway they owned. Your buyer wants the entire section hard surfaced. The seller notifies you on the 10th day that they will hard surface the driveway only on their portion. I know this is kind of a long story, but this, this is one of those, um, it could happen to any of us if we don't, you know, with these different municipalities, they all have different rules and policies. So the easement on the, on the owner next door, the neighbor's property reads that the easement reads, both parties will be responsible for the costs of repairs, et cetera, to the portion of the road easement. So our agent was very smart and wrote in on the special agreements that the seller would provide a clear municipal inspection. So there's the paragraph in there about the municipal inspection. They can have it done. And if they come back to you within 15 days, they can, it can become negotiable on the items that work they don't want to fix. But by her writing in, they'll only provide a clear municipal inspection. It turns out that that seller paid that entire driveway and it cost him $20,000. But we were concerned on the section of the easement of the property next door. The, the neighbor said, oh, don't worry about it, it's no big deal. But when they go to sell, that driveway is gonna have the same issue because it was gravel and the city's gonna require it be hard surface then our new buyer is gonna be responsible for half of that driveway per the easement. So, you know, sometimes if in doubt, write it out, one of those kind of things about the municipal inspection, I thought that was really smart because she was concerned 
about the, the municipality being really tough. And I don't know, I guess Arnold is, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it depends where you're at, Arnold, too. So Arnold is not just the fire inspection. If you're within the city limits also, which there's two parts to Arnold. There's in the city of Arnold, then there's the fire. And if you're really awesome and you have um, Rock Creek sewer, you also have to not have their sewer and scope well, done. Mm -hmm. So there's Arnold. <laughs> is a lot of fun. <coughs> Maryland Heights is like that too. Very strict about mm -hmm. things, very. Okay, so number nine, you represent the buyer. They write a backup offer and it's accepted. A week later, they decide to walk. What form do you need? So you're in a backup position and your buyers decided they found something else. I wanna get out of this. And they've not been told they've been made primary. So what form would you use? And can you just resit, resend it by a, a regular email? Yeah, there's actually, there's actually two forms that you need to use, one being the mutual release. And the second one is the, uh, uh, the backup contract form number 2120, line 17, part two. It's the buyer's notice of termination because up until that form is received by the seller at any time, the, the listing agent can call you and make you the primary. To James's question though about rescinding, you can't rescind because it's technically already accepted. That's true, correct? yes. Okay. So, so, so yeah. I have a, a follow on question about the rescinding. That offer that I got accepted, that they counter offered, they, we had like a three hour window and about one three quarter hours in the other, the um, seller's agent, the listing agent called up and said, hey, if your people don't sign it, I'm going to rescind it. Could he have done that? No. Yeah, because it wasn't accepted by all parties yet. I hear agents all the time running around saying, oh, I got an offer. I got an offer. And my first question is, what's your acceptance deadline date time? Well, we, we have until noon tomorrow. You really don't. Because up until that time, that listing agent can call you and go, we're, we're, we're out. Or the buyer's agent can call you and say, we're walking, we're, we're rescinding our offer. I worked for an agent mm -hmm. and the wife had signed and accepted it, but the husband couldn't get to it. And in between there, the buyer's rescinded. It's not accepted until both all yep. parties yep. accept. Yep. And, and it doesn't get mad. Yeah, does it ever get ugly when people say, hey, but I had, I had a- Oh my God. Oh, oh. Did. Yeah, and I, I would advise you that when you're gonna pull that, you're gonna rescind your offer. First thing you do is you call, you don't say all nicey nice stuff. You just say, James, we're rescinding our offer. I've sent over the mutual release or the, I'm sending over the- An email. An email that we're walking. But you, you, during that time, at any time they can accept it that, you know, as the buyer's agent, you know that you can do a building inspection and walk. But in this market, so many people aren't doing inspections and they're waiving all their contingencies. So you really don't have many things to walk on. Yeah. Okay. So you represent the seller. The buyer does a final walkthrough and requests all items to be removed from the basement. Sellers respond and agrees to the request. On the day of closing, the buyer asks to extend closing for two weeks and wants to have an environmental inspection because they noticed a white substance on the log cabin walls. What do you advise your seller to do? It's, it's too late, isn't it? They're outside of their inspection window. Well, here's the thing. So what if there really was, uh, what happens if the seller had, had a party that weekend and they were cooking up some meth or something <laughs> and they think, yeah, it could be in this today's world, I would not advise my seller not to let them do it. If right. they, they, they don't know what they should do, they should call their attorney. You can right. really give them advice on something like that because if they move in and you wouldn't let them have that, that second walkthrough or let an environmentalist come through and they do find it, it could get really ugly. Yeah, we had so, a buyer that waived, um, waived all inspections and then 
later decided they want to do a septic inspection and um, we told them we well we had both both sides of the deal so we told the seller we talked to the seller about it and she agreed to go ahead and let let them have the, do the septic inspection mm -hmm. so in this case i mean that that kind of a thing an environmental issue perhaps when you don't know the seller told told us that the you know it's just the air conditioner and that's what happens to log cabins and all of that but in this case, what if it really wasn't that? And they get in there and they do it and they say, you know what, we found traces of meth. They're gonna sue. Everybody's gonna get sued. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you represent the buyer. They're writing an offer on a property in University City. There are two <laughs> large line statutes on the front porch. Do they stay? You have to write, you write it in. You ask for them. That's it. That's it, Kristen. When in doubt, write it out. Okay, so some people think that they're mounted or they're not. I, you know what, if I looked at that statue right there, I'm like, yeah, he's probably mounted, but maybe he's not. So what does the inclusion say on the contract under exterior say in the contract in the section below exterior. It says exterior lighting, landscaping, and mailbox all stay. And so if you look up the word landscaping, it has many different definitions. So are they considered part of the landscaping? I think that could go to court and it could be a 50-50 whether it stayed or not. Um, I actually had this happen to one of my agents and those big lions were already on a truck headed out of state. And so the two agents ended up paying for them. And do you know how expensive they are? Pretty penny. Very. And it takes special, it's not something you just throw in the back of your pickup truck because they can crack easy too because they're concrete. So if in doubt, write it out. The big lions on the front porch stay. Okay, you represent the seller. The buyer's closing at a different title company. Closing is at three o'clock today. It's 445 and the seller and or their title company has not received the wire. Is the property closed? No, it needs to be funded, fully funded. Yes, thank you, James. So until the seller, either the seller or the seller's title company receives the money, it is not closed. So my question then is the buyer in default? Yeah, they're in breach. So, but they performed, and, and this can happen. This is why I'm telling you this. Don't close at three o'clock. That's and especially on a Friday. Because guess what? If it's my house and I don't have the money, you're not getting the keys. Mm -mm. No. Because what if those people were in a car accident over the weekend and they, they say, oh, too bad. And sometimes when there's large amounts of money going through a wire, at any time the government can grab that and take a look at it and go stop and review it. So that's why it's not smart to close late in the afternoon. Oftentimes the money doesn't make it to the, the wire doesn't make it, especially when it's two different title companies. Who's responsible for getting the keys to the buyer? See the agent representing the buyer. Right, the buyer's agent. No, the, the seller, the, the seller's responsible to get the keys to the buyer. Either they make arrangements for where they're at at the house, but this is what, and you could be closing in Arnold and, uh, they live, they're moving, they bought a house in Chesterfield. That person has to get them the keys. It's not, it's not the buyer's agent responsibility. It's the seller. Okay, we're going to go to number 13. You represent the buyer. You receive a call from the title company that the seller is out of the country and has not supplied a seller's tax ID or green card. 
Should you be concerned? Yes, I see Lisa going, yes. There's a paragraph in the contract called FIRTA, F-I-R-T-A. It's just like three lines, three sentences. I need you to read it over, make sure you understand it. Title companies aren't gonna be responsible. So if that seller leaves the country and it closes and they owe taxes, the buyer just inherited that, that yeah. tax debt. It doesn't sound fair. I, it's not my rule, it's a government rule. This is a government agent that just went through that. That's right. One of our agents just went through that. Can a buyer have more than one walkthrough according to the sale contract? Kind of covered that earlier. So the contract says one, but you could write in more than one in the special agreements. And I think I probably would if I'm, if I'm going through and I notice, oh my God, these people are hoarders and there's junk all over. I might want a second walkthrough to make sure they got the junk out. So I don't have to, so I don't get stuck with it. That's all I have for today.